So last week we completed the 41st verse of chapter 2, Sankhya Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge, where I had uh, in fact told you all to make a note, the whole philosophy of Vedanta is built around developing your intellect, buddhi, it's called in Sanskrit, because it is reason and analysis alone which can control the mind, which is composed of endless desires. And you have to first control and in the final stages even eliminate the mind if you want to get to enlightenment. So all this is done by the intellect. So people don't understand this. Even people who have been educated on so-called on the mind in the Western world, because I so many of them are my students, psychologists, psychiatrists, psychiatrists. And they themselves told me, we didn't understand that there is a difference. I said, without understanding, how can you attempt to resolve anything? The whole problem in the world is the uncontrolled mind. The emotions have gone completely out of control. Right? I've told you repeatedly. I'll keep repeating because it should go in. You want to earn money, there's no problem. But you lose control, it's greed. Then you're gone. People with billions are in jail. It's greed. You want to enjoy a drink or some junk food even, it's fine. But you lose control, you become addicted. The addiction is the problem. Which destroys your life. So everybody is addicted to something or the other. It could be relationships. You can't get your mind off, it constantly goes. You're addicted. Attached. Attachment, addiction, same thing. Addiction we call in terms of Physical objects, attachment you call in, when you talk of relationship is the same thing. It's an uncontrolled mind. So unless you understand this, this is what he says. It's defined in the 41st verse. What is mind? What is intellect? So he says the intellect is vyavasaya, the resolute. Means it has a conviction. Ekaha, single pointed. It understands, it's convinced, and it goes in one direction to achieve something. But your mind is not like that. Bahushakha. Many branches is this mind. There's no conviction. There's no single pointed focus to achieve anything. Mind can ask for anything. Many, many branches, many, many desires. And each desire. Ananta, anta end, ananta endless. Ask yourself when you started life, if you if you would have had the if you somebody told you you'll have the money you have today, you say that's it. I don't want anything more. If when you were twenty years old, now what is it? 
I have a Honda, but not a Mercedes. I have a Mercedes, but not a Bentley. Whatever. I have a Bentley, but nobody to share it with. <laughs> Wife took the money and ran away. <laughs> so, you know, everybody is endless. I have somebody to share it, but it's too much. I want to get rid of that person. I don't want to share. Could be anything. So, endless. So, you must understand these two equipments reside inside you, not inside anybody else. So, you have to strengthen that part which is has that conviction, reason, analysis and can guide your mind. But that's not done at all. So the modern mind, modern in the sense everywhere, it's just a question of less or more, is in a totally uncontrolled state. Your mind, your friend's mind, your children's mind, whole thing is out of control. Outside you look very good. Nice clothes, nice makeup, nice this, nice that. Inside the mind is totally gone. So you only look at the outer shell, celebrities and this and lifestyle, it has no meaning whatsoever. You don't understand until it's too, too late. So how, whatever it is, wherever you are in life, your goal should be to build your intellect. So you are not a slave of your own mind. Your mind enslaves you. You are dependent upon outside factors for internal happiness. That means you are a slave. Why should you depend upon anything outside? You should generate your happiness from inside. Then you are a king. You don't need any. That's the intellect. So that was 41 and before we begin, there were two questions which were sent in. First one, which is a normal question everybody has, one of the beginners who just started, he said, you talk about in this context of Karma Yoga that we should act without desires, that is what he's uh, interpreting it as, but don't you need desires to be progressive, to progress in life? So at work, how should, what should be my attitude? I'm constantly distracted by my promotions, what my boss is thinking, etc. I've just started working, some youngster. So this is I have repeated it many times, but people don't understand. You cannot work without desire because the chronology of action is desire, thought, desire, action. How can you work without any desire? So Vedanta only says your intellect should guide the desire upwards. You must Work for a purpose, your desire should be to serve, to sacrifice. So you should entertain a selfless desire to work for the benefit of others, not yourself. So same thing I would tell you, your company, you should think in terms of how you can benefit your organization. That's it. So any promotion or a bonus should be incidental to that. That should not be the thought backing it. And there are people who've told me, I have a couple of people, Wall Street, they work and finance, they say, I'm not inspired by the people who I'm working with because they're all hungry after money or our business is all about making money. So I said, you also make money. But what are you making money for? Then the money should be used for a higher purpose. So it doesn't matter what you do. What is your end goal? So people believe with this attitude you won't work. In fact, you'll work much harder, much better. 
because your mind is not disturbed by your selfishness. Your action will be infinite, literally, powerful. In fact, we are coming to that in chapter 3. He says that. Satta karmanya avidvamsaha yatha kurvanti bharata. Just as the unwise, avidvam means unwise, act, sakta, attached to action, means selfishly. Puryan, Vidwan, Tatha, Asaktaha. The wise should act unattached. Chikirshu Loka Sangraham. Wishing the welfare of the world. That is the central theme of the Gita. Where Krishna advises Arjuna not to fight the battle for his personal kingdom. But for the sake of the society, which needs the Kauravas to be removed because they are a detriment. That should be the attitude. That is the whole Vedanta. What are you working for? And that's why the fundamental fulcrum of the Vedas, of the Upanishads is the concept of Yajna, sacrifice. It's not a ritual of fire worship. It, when you give grain, grain represents food, which means the body. It's symbolic of giving up your selfishness for a higher purpose. So that is the main concept of spirituality, where you sacrifice your selfishness. So what are we talking? It's not that you should stop acting, but act for yajna. For sacrifice. And you will be right on top. You will become your boss's boss soon. Don't worry. That fellow is selfish. People want to keep. Have people who work for the organization. Not for themselves. So where is the problem? Number one. Second question is. I follow. Your lectures online and they have helped me tremendously. But I find myself distracted uh, when listening. How do I approach this so I get the maximum benefit? So this is probably somebody from who watches on YouTube. In fact, far more people watch the recordings than these live sessions. Uh, so what I would recommend, those of you who, who are who will listen to this recording sooner or later, that you should try and attend the live session first of all. Because, not because I want you to, because there's a discipline. Every Sunday or Saturday you have to make aside a time. It becomes like a class. When you watch recordings, it's on your own time. Then they'll watch for 20 minutes. Now let's have tea. Pause. And go make coffee. How are you going to... This is this is not, uh, uh, you know, a movie which you pause and rewind. And uh, there has to be a sanctity to it. So if you're serious, it's, again, it's not that I want you to. For your sake, you should. Because that creates that discipline. So your mind is less... Distracted. You have that time. And secondly is you must listen in an environment which is not disturbed. You understand? So make a place in your home which is secluded. It's called in the Gita Swayamasana, your own seat. Very interesting because the whole Gita is about removing your selfishness. And the only place he allows you to have your own seat is when you are studying the scriptures. Because it should have that sanctity. Like how you have a temple in the house. There is a sanctity. You don't change it. Today my temple is in my garage. Day after we are going to put it in the attic. 
then why do you change your place to sit when you are studying? So, there is a thought association that yes, this place is associated with spiritual study. You understand? Undisturbed. One time a person had asked, can I uh, listen to you while cooking? I said, why don't you cook? That's better. At least you'll feed your family. Hmm. Yeah, well, you want to listen to this and uh, cutting cucumbers in one hand and listening. There's no head or tail. Now, what to tell people? Because there is no sanctity to it. When you are in a college class, you will say, can I, can I bring my uh, cooking items in the, uh, uh, in, during the class? The professor will say, get lost. So I can't say because you can do whatever you want. Mm. But for your sake, there should be concentration. So make it easier on yourself. Otherwise, obviously you will get distracted. No phone should be there. These are obvious things, but what is important is a particular place which you associate with your spiritual study. And so attending live and then even amongst you, those who attend live, see 20% have their videos on, 80% God knows what they are doing, same. So it's not that I want to see your face, but if you know that I am seeing you, Automatically, it's like a classroom. You're automatically in attention. Otherwise, coffee, tea, sometimes samosa also in the middle. Why not? So, what are you? Uh, so, it makes it conducive for you. Becomes a classroom setting. And then there's a Program, you take down your notes and next morning you can read the notes along with the corresponding part of the text. If you are reading the Gita, you have to get uh, Swamiji's Gita, I would recommend. My gurus, there are hundreds of Gita, the one by, because it has the explanation and the topics after each verse. And then Saturday is the Vedanta treatise, that book definitely you should have. Then you read that particular part which we followed the next morning. So you have completely consolidated. You've done whatever you could for that class. So these little tips make it useful. I'm glad you asked. Whoever asked. They said keep it anonymous. I don't understand what is this anonymous. The email also comes SK, PV, US. How much anonymity you want, I don't understand. Anyway. That itself is part of ego. That I. Why are you so bothered about that I of yours? You don't, your, don't want your name. Whether it's there or not, that should not matter. But anyway, it's good you ask because it will help others and yourself, of course. Whoever asked. <coughs> yes. Okay, let's finish this. So, all of you understood the what you need to do to get your so since the mind by itself is prone to distraction you need external help you all should understand that because the mind functions on the principle of thought association see if you are in a place of work in your office desk and you are listening to this the thought association is the office work so it will automatically go there so that's why he says you need a place which is purely meant for this. If you cannot manage because of whatever, lack of space, or then of course it's okay. But try and make it as conducive. So a place is important. Attending live gives you the classroom, student, disciple feeling, which is very important. See the Upanishads, what is the, the what is the meaning of the word Upanishad, you know? Those of you who don't know, Upanishads are the highest philosophical compositions of the Vedas, far before Bhagavad Gita. In fact, Gita only explains the Upanishads. It's a secondary text, even though it's the most well-known text. It's not the primary spiritual text. So, Upa means near. Ni means below, Shad means sit. 
सो उपनिषद मीन्स नियर बिलो सिट नियर मीन्स यू आर रिसेप्टिव यू आर राइट दे मास्टर्स दे टॉकिंग यू आर राइट दे ऑटोमेटिक रिसेप्टिव इट बिलो मीन्स यू हैव एन एटीट्यूड ऑफ डिवोशन डिवोशन फ्लोज फ्रॉम द लोअर टू द हायर When you look up, there's devotion. When you look down, there's ego. So it's automatic. I remember when I first came to America as a 17-year-old, our first class uh, in college, psychology 101 or whatever it was, and all the because it's a big class, you know. Other classes were smaller. Maybe a couple of hundred freshmen there. Stand, sitting and you know the halls how they are set up you look down to the teacher so the fellow has a coke in one hand sandwich in the other yeah what do you got to say man hmm? you looking down to your teacher that's why there is no devotion at all no gratitude i paid my tuition now talk that's the attitude what well, that is not the attitude so below there has to be devotion and sit means you are in one place you are introvert not distracted that is the ideal teaching environment one on one a few disciples and a teacher sitting close together now where is that and where is this now zoom hmm? Hmm. everything is zoomed you understand so at least make it as close to the real thing as possible It's for your benefit in fact people even come here uh physically they say it's totally different fellows come from pennsylvania and i don't know manhattan they not they hike they drive uh, over an hour most of them are close by but it's worth it at least occasionally just to get away from your environment they all say it's totally different than sitting at home so environmental support is very important because the mind is not capable of standing on its own so wherever possible give your mind that support so you will learn more to me trust me it makes absolutely no difference right yes so that was this part of it yeah you had something you know in the first question uh, and karma when you do service um when you do the action with the intention of service and sacrifice and after completion of the task you still realize that it is because you like to do that kind of a task is that true karma then or is it based on like this lesson you are doing something to serve and sacrifice after that action you realize that you like to do the action does that mean it is not selfless is your question right not necessarily because in fact you are advised to take up a field of action according to your likes and dislikes which is your swadharma swadharma is your predominant powerful desire like right so you have a powerful predilection from childhood towards medicine you should be a doctor because if you are not you will be frustrated all your life so you need to take a field of action according to your nature but in that field don't function selfishly function for a higher purpose that is totally different so you are doing it consciously with your intellect so you are not frustrated but that field you should function self now a doctor could be totally selfish there are doctors who have been jailed for uh, prescribing things which they should not and uh, prescribing drugs and all kinds of things I read one recent, and there are doctors who, in this COVID, they died, uh, knowing fully well that they may not survive. To help patients, I salute them. 
they are the real selfless people in this world so but you like other parts of it then you have to be careful so your friend who you really liked asked you for a favor and your neighbor who you can't stand the sight of also asked you of course i serve my friend no that so the determining principle there should be what is my obligation i may not like my neighbor but their child needs some particular help at this time she is at work and he uh, is stuck in the school versus your friend who just called you uh, i'll feel bad if you don't come join me for snacks and you say see i w- i went to serve her no because she would have felt bad this is all desire you understand there you have to use your intellect and nullify your personal preference so personal likes and dislikes definitely you have to control but the field of action generally in life should be in accordance with your predominant nature that's the only exception ashok um hari om gautam ji hmm. so uh, kind of a similar question like related to that question so assuming someone is working with an attitude of sacrifice and service but hmm. then you know you have aggressive bad people trying to exploit and giving you let's say more work than what you can do right uh, how would uh, would you suggest to deal with such kind of situation especially in the corporate environment use your intellect that's all aggressively bad person means a selfish person who's using their thinking intellect to manipulate others this is exactly what's happening in the world why are the corrupt and all flourishing because they use their intellect to take advantage of the vast majority masses who are passively good this is the this is the fundamental problem in this world right so the only way to counter them is to use your intellect but for a higher purpose you are not using your intellect so make sure you use the intellect and when they are uh, and pr- try and figure out how you can counter that that is purely depending on the situation otherwise you will be taken advantage of the minute people know you are helpful uh, we've got a goat hmm? finish him off that's all that is what is the problem in the world so the very few people are good uh in fact most people are passively good i would say vast majority of humanity is good they are not uh you know exploiting others but they are passive so they are taken advantage of so this is the life of lord krishna which is why he is called purna avatar complete manifestation of divinity because not only was he selfless but he used his intellect and they purposely showed examples of him literally asking yudhishthira to lie of asking arjuna to kill karna when he was not in a position to fight all those things which are criticized but nobody understands the reason these are all aggressively bad fellows if you don't use your intellect they'll finish you off so you better use your intellect but for a higher purpose it's very difficult but you have to work towards it so read that portion in the vedanta treatise is there the aggressive and the passive this is a totally original contribution of swami ji it's not explained anywhere in any text it's complete original that there are these four types of people in the world aggressive two types aggressive and the passive an aggressive passive is not uh, should not be translated how you understand 
is not aggressive means you are fighting all the time aggressive is used in the context of using your intellect consciously thinking passive not using intellect just going by emotions so passively good people which is the vast majority of human beings are good but they don't use their intellect and passively bad people are the ones like who are born in the family of criminals and they don't they're not consciously being bad but they don't know anything else so these are called passively bad people very few are there like that that's the majority of humans the minority i would say 5% who are aggressive 4.9% out of those are aggressively bad these are the people prospering in the world today they they viciously manipulate use their intellect for their selfish purposes so they will so they prey on the vast majority this is the law whoever uses the intellect will succeed but they are totally agitated extremely disturbed people you understand you can't that law will function they need a, a bottle to sleep they need uh, all kinds of things stimulants to keep them going mind is so disturbed because desires are insatiable so what you are learning here is to be selfless good and use your intellect nobody will be able to take advantage of you you will not take advantage of anybody and you will use your intellect for the benefit of others now you must at least aspire to be somewhere close to that state at least little bit otherwise you sit and suffer what to do my family fam within family also they know one brother knows who's the other who's the other brother goat hmm? <laughs> and they simply go and then they know who will not be able to say no so they take advantage full scale <laughs> so this is the world i'm saying between siblings it happens it's not uh, i'm not talking anything it will happen where it happens in the house all the time in your own house <laughs> you know who's the most aggressive in the house your children <laughs> they know who how which parent to take advantage of this mother of mine if i cry she won't respond father will respond so he'll go in front of the father ah, what happened what happened what happened and get what they want see they know so what what is happening they are using your thinking to prey on your emotion your passive in that area you could be a ceo i know ceo wife comes to the city for shopping there neither see no <coughs> everything goes you know I'm, i'm sitting in the office very busy i can't meet i can't meet. wife's coming and all meeting everything gone he has to go carry her bags so within that so wherever you are emotionally weak you will be taken advantage by a person who knows that this is the law of life so you better have that protection of your intellect you get it hmm. see all these questions are more important than simply covering the verses you know, these are practical things which you should understand these are all implied in the text nobody has ever explained them so that's why i said in the i think is the 8th chapter light of wisdom from what i remember in the vedanta treatise uh those of you uh, most of you have the book those of you who don't mm, i'll tell you yeah light of wisdom chapter 7 not 8 7 chapter 7 light of wisdom the aggressive and the passive 
in the Vedanta treatise, the eternities. Yes, sir. So, so in the uh, Mahabharata, um, you know, at the end of the 14 years, um, the Pandavas are entitled to have the kingdom back. Um, <clears throat> but just to avoid the war, uh, they, or at least what I understood was, uh, they say we are okay to get even five villages and give up the rest of the kingdom. Now, in that case, is that being passive? Good or you know, I, I couldn't. I just so you're asking in the Mahabharata, for example, the Pandava brothers who were exiled upon return were entitled to half the kingdom, but they were willing to settle for five villages to avoid a conflict, right? Yeah, so is that being passive? It all depends on the situation. There, they felt there's no point, so much bloodshed. They will get the five villages and consolidate after that. They will easily win back the whole thing. So they thought, let's at least start. Right? In that sense, Krishna said, yes, let's at least start with this. His, his whole intention was to finish off the Kaurava. But at least you have to settle them. No, You need a place to stay. You're going into a new town to build an empire. First, you need a place to stay or no? That was their whole this thing. Uh, that was the reasoning behind it, as far as Krishna was concerned. They have no thinking. Pandavas, they couldn't think at all on, on their own. That's why Yudhishthira lost everything, because he was a typical example of passive goodness. Right? So once Krishna came into the picture, who's aggressively good, he said, let's start like this. Then we'll get the whole thing back. What is due to you? Vikram. Gautamji, there's a question from Ahimsa Wellness Yoga. Is the intellect like a muscle? Do you need to exercise it? Yes. One word answer is yes. The intellect is like a muscle. Like, uh, like how you would look at a physical muscle in your body. It only gets stronger by exercising, stretching and strengthening. So, intellect is like that at the thought level. So, you have to strengthen and stretch the thoughts. And that is why I tell you all repeatedly, you have to do that early in the morning. You have to stretch and strengthen your intellect. Because uh, unlike your physical muscles, which are available in the evening also, you can go to the gym in the evening. You can't read this in the evening. It will not help you. Because the intellect itself, the real intellect is not available at that time. It's available only in the early hours of the morning. And then by 6, 6.30, the mind's desires take over. That's why during the day you have to act to fulfill your desires. And by the time the evening, the both the mind intellect are in a sleep mode. So you want to watch TV. You want to have a drink. That's not the time to study. So it has to be done early in the morning. Correct. So think of it as a muscle which has to be strengthened. And even if a muscle is strong, it has to be maintained. Right? The existing strength has to be maintained and it has to grow. So that study reflection continues till you hit enlightenment. You have to keep doing it. Got it? So, 42, 43 and 44 are chanted together. Now, these three verses are important because here, like many, many masters before him, Krishna is explaining how this addiction to rituals and not understanding the meaning of the text is totally detrimental to you as an individual and society as a whole. So we'll read them, uh, we'll chant them first and then 
look at what they have to say hmm. yami mam pushpitam vacham pravadantya vipaschitah vedavadaratah patha nanyadasti divarinah flowery speech pushpitam vacham rejoicing in the letter of the veda opartha veda vada saying there is nothing else but this 43 obsessed with desires with heaven as the ultimate goal of birth and action they prescribe many specific rites for the attainment of bhoga aishwarya pleasure and power 44 those who are attached to pleasure and power whose minds are drawn away by that flowery speech have no determined intellect devasayatmika buddhi samadhau na vidhiyate have no determined intellect fixed in samadhi enlightenment god consciousness now see how beautifully what has been said thousands of years ago is exactly the same today people all over the world who call themselves religious spiritual nothing to do with religiosity spirituality what did i explain to you yesterday that spirituality is that by which you merge with your real self the source of absolute bliss eternity immortality that is what is the highest that is god and that is what you are tat satya sa atma tatvamasi says the upanishad that is the truth that is the self that is what you are now where is that and where is this so people approach religion spirituality with a totally selfish perspective which he calls here obsessed with desires heaven means heaven means they want that state of enjoyment in the future happiness enjoyment 
and they believe by doing this they will get pleasure power and heaven bhoga aishwarya swarga exactly what's happening happened then forget about the gita at the time of the upanishads also it happened in fact i told you when you were doing in the retreat the early vedas did not contain upanishads because they were rituals ceremonies but people became so addicted to the ceremonies without understanding the purpose that the upanishads had to be written later on and appended to the vedas to convey that the real thing is the philosophy others are just rituals to remind you of the philosophy then everybody understood after a while they stopped understanding then came the gita because the whole vedic understanding had gone by then this is the time of krishna imagine what it is now there is no understanding there is no overstanding also you, you can't stand under you can't stand over because there is no standing only so they who who are attached to pleasure and power have no determined intellect fixed in samadhi they are not interested in enlightenment so take away 99.99% who call themselves religious spiritual they are not interested period so you go temples and churches and mosques why do you go ask yourself that i am not against going it has a purpose the purpose is to remind yourself your purpose is samadhi enlightenment so what do you go for take care of me take care of my family if i do this i'll be taken care of if i don't do this something bad may happen and the so called spiritual people are the ones who are giving out these blessings i went to that person my business became good then he tell all his friends that fellow's business will become good who's that so called spiritual fellow that's how their business becomes good if you if you believe your business is good that fellow business will become good this is what is going on unbelievable i don't think now they would have bothered writing also even swami ji gave up at the end <laughs> my guru no point 12 books he wrote so do not approach this knowledge with any selfish axe to grind it will not help you this knowledge is meant for people who want to grow even if you don't understand enlightenment at least you must understand i want to evolve as a human being i want to grow i don't want to just follow this materiality sensuality blindly there must be something beyond it only such people can relate to what this knowledge is rest we don't want because they can't understand if they could will do anything they can't so understand the wrong part of it you should not approach this for anything personal benefit people approach for solace even that is wrong oh i am so disturbed is not going to help you is this is not meant as a balm to soothe your issues it is meant as the knowledge of what life is really all about that's why the real students are those who have seen everything in life who may have everything but they understand there is not this is all useless there has to be something beyond it they are not enamored of the world those are the real students right you see how it all fits in 
So all these people, my blessings, my this, I won't have, I went for blessing, I went for this thing, I went for that thing. I know a fellow, I know, I don't know him, not worth knowing, but of him. He's a big businessman here. So those days, now of course that flight is not there. That uh, United used to go, no, uh, night to night. I Air India goes, but uh, that that time it was United, which we used to also take. So it goes uh, from here, New Jersey. It reaches Mumbai in the night. So direct, non-stop, and one reaches Delhi. That fellow goes to the Delhi. So Friday night he leaves. After work, he goes straight. This is not a joke. Huh? Saturday night, he reaches there. Then he takes a car or whatever to a place which he considers holy. He reaches there uh, Sunday morning. He gets the darshan, the VIP line they get. And then uh, come Sunday night, he takes the flight back. From Delhi to New York, and Monday morning he's at work. This is not the one. Not, not every weekend. No, he must be, nobody can handle that. But once in three, uh, religiously, once in three months. And that uh, fellow was telling me was saying, "See, what a religious. Look at that." I said, "Have you asked him why he goes?" Yeah, he said he told me. He said why? He says uh, he believes that is what keeps his business going. <laughs> he is doing very, very well. He wants to make sure nothing happens. No, this is not a joke. He wants to make sure. He is a millionaire. He wants to make sure he remains a millionaire. I think he goes there and prays that tax fellows here don't come and find out. Or I don't know. So, is this spirituality? So, so you are going to fulfill your selfish desire. So it becomes transactional. It's like a business. I do something for you. You do something back for me. That is not spirituality. That is business. That is transaction. So why you do a ritual? Again, the ritual is important. Is to remind you that your purpose is to get to the self. And you do that, everything is taken care of. Yes, let's go this side to this side. <laughs> Manish. Hmm? Hi. So you mentioned that you know um, if someone is seeking spirituality uh, to uh, feel better, if they're gone through some difficult times in life and they decide, okay, they they, they need to explore this path. But if this is not a bomb, then so isn't that like a hopeless situation? Then that the person is caught in then and and not able to uh, find any solace anywhere. No, no. See, if you are going for mental solace, what will happen if you are not a seeker is the minute you get that solace, this pursuit will stop. You are just going to feel better. So, you are not a true seeker. The, the situation, a difficult situation may have propelled you to the spiritual path. That may happen. But you will remain there whether or not the situation remains. You understand? This is the test. So, uh, a, a negative situation may come and you may think, what is this? Is this what life is really all about in spite of working and this thing? It's so fragile. That could be a true seeker. That situation propels you that yes, there is something more than all this. And you'll remain committed to that. But a person who's doing it specifically for solace, the minute they get that solace or that situation goes, that pursuit stops. So that's why they're not true seekers. The 
So the true seeker is one, regardless of the situation, they would continue to pursue. That's why, so what you're saying could happen. But the test is you may have everything in life, but you still understand it's futile, it's limited, it's finite. What is the use? It all ends in old age and death. That is what Nachiketas went for. He saw, he saw corn being cut in the field. He said, that is us. You grow, you live, you're cut. And then the next generation comes. What is this? Is this life? There has to be more to that. You know? That is the seeker who understands the futility in spite of having everything. But yes, a negative situation could propel you. It could even be a positive situation. You won the lottery, that could make you spiritual. What have I done to deserve such a big payout, so much money? That could make you spiritual. How does life work? So it has nothing to do with positive or negative. It has to do with a genuine understanding of the futility of the world and a desire to liberate yourself from that. It's called in Sanskrit Mumukshatva, the desire for liberation. That has to be there. And that is independent of what all you get in the world. Thank you. Hmm. Yes, Umesh. Yeah, Gautamji, uh, what is what is the significance of pujas? And there can be very elaborate rituals inside pujas and some people do it every day so what i told you the the significance is to remind you that your purpose is to reach the self if you're using it for that that's fine i told you last week right the elaborate 10 day festival we have last week it ended navaratri and ending in vijayadashami it's all symbolic First three days you worship Durga, means removal of the negative tendencies. Next three days you worship Lakshmi, cultivation of the positive tendencies. That creates the right environment for spiritual knowledge. Next three days is Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge. You perfect knowledge, you destroy your ego completely. That's the tenth day of victory, It's called it's symbolizing enlightenment. The, the you there's a you burn the ego right the effigy of Ravana the demon all highly symbolic very elaborate now it's become a means for indulgence first day we make this in the house second day we make this special item third day we make this special item and then fourth day we do this we you know, where is the whole uh, significance go on So, India is a land of these rituals and festivals and pujas. Pujas means prayers traditionally because every time there was an opportunity, they put in a ritual to remind yourself. So, there is a full moon ritual, half moon ritual, no moon ritual. So, any opportunity to remind you. Death ritual, birth ritual, marriage ritual. Even dance was in the temple. There was no dancing otherwise. The dance was an offering to God. Songs was a only the only subject matter of songs was God. So every aspect of life was a dedication to the self. Where is that and where are we? So we'll take up further questions uh, next time. Otherwise, you can email them and we can take them up on Wednesday. You can also catch up on the... Those of you who can't make the live Wednesday, you can catch up on the recording, as we had said. Hmm. So we'll see you when we see you. Hari Om. Hari Om.